Hey, hi guys. Uh, app travel hacking. Uh, yeah, if you haven't read the uh, the abstract, it's it's such a wide topic. We can't cover it all. It's like something. It's okay. It's for frequent flyer miles, getting more miles for cheap, uh, getting status. There's some physical hacking involved. Like there's tricks to actually convert some regular seats into full flat beds, which uh, comes comes in nicely uh, every once in a while if you manage to get one of those seats that you can actually trick into getting full flat. But what I'm going to talk about is. Uh, like the uh, how's, how affairs being set up, how can you uh, look what kind of flights you can get for which price, and uh, eventually how to save some money. Uh, yeah, we can skip that thing, uh, who I am. Uh, I'm traveling, traveling for business a bit, but then uh, mostly for my, sp my spare time, I'm a travel aid addict. So done more than, I think now it's 550, 560, whatever flights that I know of, that probably are more. Been to 60 countries, 29 times around the globe. Only been denied entry to the US once, which, uh, I don't know why that's only been once because I've been doing day trips from Europe to the US, showing up at immigration saying, when are you flying back? It's like, yeah, in a couple of hours. Uh, you look like a drug runner, so you get the uh, special treatment, but only happened once to me that I uh, really wasn't allowed in the country. Uh, what I'm going to talk about, I said, uh, air travel, like how do the, uh, the fares work and how do we find bugs in those systems? And the most interesting part, how can we save money on, on uh, travel? Like, I'm going to have an example. For a flight that's going to be uh, kind of expensive, kind of cheap, but we get it down to essentially half the price. You can just book it for half the price of what they actually advertise. Uh, before we can start, I'm going to rush through this a bit. So I'm going to give you a couple of introductions and terms they're going to use throughout the presentation. Uh, if you have any questions, please ask immediately because I guess we won't have much time at the end because of so many slides. Um, you probably know this. There are service classes on planes, essentially economy, business, First class, you know all these seats, the seats you, you see you get on a, on a plane. That's sometimes also referred as like the hard metal, the kind of stuff that you see. Uh, from a marketing perspective, we have booking classes. Booking classes are used to separate economy class into multiple classes you can use for marketing, like dirt cheap economy class, which might not always be available, even though there are seats available in the physical economy class, so they can restrict selling cheap seats while they can still sell uh, more expensive economy seats. Uh, all these booking classes are referenced to by single characters, uh, essentially A to Z. Uh, first class is typically called F, business class C, uh, economy Y. Uh, it all depends a bit on the airlines, but those are generally true. Um, sometimes if you go to travel websites, you can actually see how full the plane is because they show something like the uh, F9, A4, C9, whatever thing, and th that lists the number of open seats in every respective booking class. It never goes above nine, so that's why they say, oh, if you want to do a group booking, please call, because on the, on the website we cannot tell you the system doesn't allow you to book more than nine seats because they never have the inventory for more than nine seats open, available in, in, on the open internet, on the open booking system. But you can see like this, uh, F9 means there's nine seats open in, in uh, first class. A4, it's like the uh, discounted first class. So they're only selling four, they're not selling nine, so which means that the revenue management kind of influences, okay, we only want to sell four of the cheaper ones, or, we, or they probably already sold a couple of ones, so that's why I'm showing a, a smaller number. Uh, also interesting, later in the talk, when you're seeing fair basis, I come to that later, the first character of the fair basis is always the booking class the fair books into, which is interesting to know, because then you can see, I have that fair, can I actually book that flight? You can just look. Do I have inventory? Do I have an open seat? Does it show anything other than zero for that respective booking class on my flight? Um, some other terms, uh, we have the operating carrier for a flight. It's easy. Lufthansa owns a plane. They operate a flight to, to New York. It's called LH-401. Goes Frankfurt, New York. That's it. They might have a marketing carrier. Lufthansa, for instance, has uh, regional partners like Singapore has Silk Air in, uh, down here, or you have uh, Firefly for, for Malaysian. And they have, um, they're, they're the dis distinct own airline, but they share the same uh, codes with the, uh, the parent airline, like Firefly or Lufthansa does, but they are marketed by a different, by a different carrier. In this, this case, for instance, Lufthansa or Malaysian Airlines or Singapore Airlines. Um, then we have code share flights. Code shares are, are as easy. Lufthansa, United, Conjunto, they all operate flights across the Atlantic. And they all allow each other to sell seats on the respective other airlines. So you have a Lufthansa flight 41, 
And United also allows you to buy seats on that flight on their own website. So they sell it on a so-called code share flight, which in this case gets the name UA for United 8840. And there's uh, usually more than one, just one code share on every single flight. Um, when it comes to ticketing, you have uh, plating issuing, validating carriers. Um, you can issue a ticket based on a, of a Lufthansa flight on Lufthansa ticket on, on the United website. There hasn't, doesn't, you can book a Lufthansa trip on the United website. It doesn't have to be, there doesn't have to be anything United involved to be able to book something on a different website. Um, the ticket you're going to get kind of looks like a United ticket. I'm going to show you next. But it's just the Lufthansa flight. Any questions? Okay, great. You probably all know that. Uh, just a quick question. How many of you guys? Oh, you, Okay, the, uh, yeah, the, the question is, if there's a code share, do both airlines have the same price, right? Okay, that's uh, both airlines manage the inventory separately. So it could be that Lufthansa is still selling seats on their own flight, but they deny United to sell seats because they want to sell the seats for, for their own customers. So the price can be different. Sometimes it's actually cheaper to buy a ticket or a flight on a, on a code share than issuing the ticket on the operating carrier. So this not always has to be the same. There are some tricks on ticketing, um, like when you search for a fare or for a flight, it shows like, if, if you go to travel website, it shows like 20 different combinations, and you figure out, okay, why are these all essentially the same flights, the same times? It's just different combinations of code shares and how, how you're going to issue the ticket. Uh, usually it's the same price, but it could be different. Good question. Um, so what do we actually see on a ticket? Uh, this is a Lufthansa ticket, like you can see in the, on the background. Uh, it was printed on Lufthansa printer, but if you look at the, uh, the top left, you see that it's printed on United ticket stock, which means the uh, ticket number, the electronic ticket number starts with 016. That's the identifier for United Airlines. So I bought a ticket, probably on the United website, um, for flight from Hamburg to Frankfurt on Lufthansa. Also, it's also shown uh, as, a, as a United code share. Um, but I went to the uh, Lufthansa counter because United doesn't have a counter in Hamburg. It's kind of small airport. And I got, I got it printed on, on Lufthansa paper, but still it's a United ticket, and I can just fly. Uh, it shows the uh, service class, economy. And if you look at the uh, small boarding stuff, you see in the, in the middle of it, there's the uh, capital S, which is the actual booking class. So you can always uh, see what kind of booking class you have. Uh, top right, interesting to know the uh, sequence number. I'm the third guy to check in for that flight, because I usually check in like 24 hours early. Um, if you check in late, or Anytime you check in, you can see how many people are checked in. You can kind of guess if the flight is going to be full, because if you're checking in an hour early and there's 300 people checked in for a flight that only has 200 seats, you know, oh, good stuff is going to happen. I can, uh, like, uh, get bummed or they're just overbooked. I can earn some money. Uh, if there's only five, five people um, on board, you know you've got plenty of space. So that's uh, interesting to look at. Uh, this is a different ticket, in this case, uh, United. Um, bottom left, you still have the uh, same United number. In this case, they also print the uh, so-called PNR on it, the uh, Papa Foxtrot Zero Charlie 84. That's like the uh, reservation that I used. Um, lower right corner is interesting. It says coupon number four, which means on the ticket, I had at least four separate flights. And like back in the old days, you would actually get like small paper tickets they would hand over and get on the plane. And this is like all electronic. But this just means it's the uh, fourth flight on that ticket that I had. Uh, different ticket. In this case, it uh, shows 257 for the uh, Austrian Airlines ticket stock. Uh, got lucky, got an upgrade to business class on that one. Uh, capital C is the uh, service class. Uh, you see, also see the uh, C as booking class. Also got the miles for that, which is nice because more miles. And uh, you can also see the uh, Vienna. Oh, it's kind of dark on the, on the screen. Sorry about that. Um, it shows that the uh, ticket was printed in, in Vienna, and it also shows the uh, agent who actually printed the ticket because I was at the counter given the upgrade by, by a real person. So they can, they can track it back to whoever issued that ticket if anything bad happens. Um, well, these are, are more tickets. What's interesting about these is if you look at the uh, ticket stock numbers, uh, 45 is LAN, which is an airline that's from uh, South America. Um, part of the One World Alliance, but the uh, flight I took was from Hamburg to Palma de Mallorca. 
um, on Lufthansa. So it's a totally different airline, totally different alliance, and there's no reason whatsoever to have a ticket from a Lufthansa flight on LAN ticket stock. So, I mean, if somebody would see it, they would probably get suspicious, but they couldn't do anything about it. But it, it really looks weird. Uh, same with the next one. Uh, ticket stock number one is American Airlines. Uh, also different airline or different alliance. Why would I have a Lufthansa flight or Swiss flight issued on American Airlines ticket stock? Doesn't make any sense, but essentially this is what part of this talk is about. A um, bit of history on the booking systems. Um, every airline started using its own system. Um, like I remember, you, you get like stickers, really you have like a paper ticket, and they have like a, a small sticker with a seat number on it, and they would just put it on your ticket and tell you, okay, now they only have one sticker per flight, and now they know that the seat is taken, they put it on your ticket, and you, you bought. Uh, it was pretty interesting, interesting look at it if, if you see some old videos on YouTube and stuff. Um, in the 80s, Airlines started doing uh, computerized systems. Uh, usually, the research and, and, and building those systems development was all funded by the airlines. So, like United built their own system, and they kind of kind of integrated other airlines into the same system. But I mean, honestly, you have a system that's owned and operated by United Airlines, and you have some other small carrier on the same system, and some agent just pulls up a flight. Which flight would you show for a certain way? I mean, you would definitely show or have a bias towards uh, showing your own flights before your, your competition flights. So in the 90s, um, those companies, those systems became way too expensive. They started outsourcing that. And uh, like the big airlines, United, Lufthansa, all those, they started creating computerized reservation systems, global reservation systems, which were still funded by the airlines, but claimed to be independent of the, uh, of the airlines. So now we have essentially uh, Amadeus, Worldspan, Galileo. Those are the, uh, the big names uh, yeah, every once in a while see. And there's also way more regional partners for uh, Japan, Korea, China, African, uh, so many I didn't even know that they existed. Um, interesting enough, most of the uh, systems can also be used to book rental cars or hotels. Um, before we, we go into the uh, reservation system, we have to see what makes up a fare. Uh, this is um, a PDF that, for instance, Lufthansa would send out to all the travel agencies like a day or a couple of days before they actually announce a fare officially on the internet. It's just like a heads up. You, you, can, you can advertise this to your customers and, and uh, yeah, get some customers. Uh, in a nutshell, it says uh, between May and June this year, uh, we are selling um, cheap fares to Africa, Middle East, and Asia. Um, that's the, uh, the cost of the base fare listed. The, uh, the booking class on the right side, it's uh, conditions, like when are you allowed to fly, uh, how much time you have to, to book beforehand, um, that kind of stuff. You've probably, you've probably seen this. Um, you can look this fare up on, uh, on a reservation system. I specifically bought access to a website called expertflyer.com. You, like, uh, you, you pay like 10 bucks a, a month, but it allows you to look up some information that you would usually not be able to find on the internet that, as easy as you can here. Um, they are paying by the query, so every time you click on something, uh, essentially that company is paying uh, Amadeus or travel agency to look up that information for them, and it's dis displayed nicely on the page. And the uh, same fare that Lufthansa announced on the uh, previous PDF, you can see like the second line, it's the, uh, exactly the fare, it's uh, when it's bookable, um, minimum stay, how many days beforehand you have, to, you have to book it. And we also see there's another fare from uh, OS, which is Austrian, which is uh, almost 20 bucks cheaper for the, uh, for the same route for almost the same time. Um, from this page, you can also look at the fare details and routing rules, which is, uh, which is interesting. So if you're really interested, getting an uh, expert flyer is, is very recommended. Okay. Does this system uh, give you more fare than, say, other commercial agents that tend to, like, in the U.S. or Britain? Orbits, if you, if you look up a flight on Orbits, it would only show a flight if seats are actually available and you comply with all the rules. Uh, what you can do here is you can just tell it, uh, without caring about when I'm traveling or if there are seats available, just show me what would be possible. Like this, you can use to look up what is the cheapest flight in theory that I could ever get if seats are available. And then you have to look at the, uh, the fare rules and the routing rules and then check the inventory and see, do I have seats available on, on the date I, I want to fly? And then uh, essentially you can is issue a ticket. And only if all those preconditions are given, you can essentially see that ticket on Orbitz, Expedia, and all those uh, sites. Um, it's, it's 
in my opinion, the best site, I mean, you're paying, but it's, it's the best site to um, really look that information up. Uh, there's open free tools, I have that, that later, but they are not as good. I'm, I'm happy to shell out a couple of bucks to use this. Um, I mean, it's all about, it's, it, essentially, it's all about getting that information for free, but I mean, I'm doing this so much, so often, that it just saves me so much time, it's just worth it. Um, if you look at the routing rules, you can often look this up um, on the internet. If, like, if you're in orbits, you can try to look it up. Uh, usually, orbits doesn't show you this, or uh, Expedia, but Expert Flyer is just a click on one of the, uh, the, the rightmost button, which looks kind of funny, uh, the icon, and it just shows you this. Oops. With this, uh, the same information, the uh, fair basis, the uh, LN and whatever thing that we've seen before, uh, additional information, pricing, it's like an adult fair, when, when can I fly, when can I book, and also on the, uh, the bottom part, the uh, blue stuff, it shows which routes am I allowed to, allowed to fly. Do I have to fly directly? Or in this case, I'm, uh, it's Frankfurt to Dubai, and I can connect in, in lots of German cities, and I can even take a second connection. So if I want to maximize the miles I'm getting, I know based on this fare, I don't have to fly direct. I can connect twice. I can fly Frankfurt to Munich, to Zurich, to Dubai for essentially the same price. So only if you know that you can improve your routing, you can just punch that in on Orbit's Expedia. As a multi-stop, you get more miles. But this is not really what this is about. It's uh, part of the game, but it's going to get better. Uh, fair rules, uh, yeah, you all read this? No. Um, fair rules are complicated. Um, I, just to save time, I'm just going to skip it. Fair rules say, when can I fly? For instance, the fare is valid from now to next year, April. But we're going to block out Christmas because we want to sell you a more expensive ticket over Christmas. That's what they're using the, uh, the booking classes for. They just block out traveling over Christmas on that fare, and then they have a more expensive fare, which you can book over Christmas. Uh, they tell you how many days you have to stay. Like, you know, when you're, you're just staying one day or going on a business trip, same day return, it's just ridiculously expensive. If you happen to stay an additional day or you stay over the weekend, it suddenly gets cheaper. That's the uh, stay requirements that kick in and prevent you from booking a cheap fare. Uh, it also shows, like you've seen before, the routes you can take, the uh, permitted flights, like you're supposed to only fly like Lufthansa, Swiss, whatever. It allows you, uh, it shows you how often you're allowed to connect in different cities. If you're allowed to make a connection that is more than 24 hours, that's called a stopover, whereas a layover is just an immediate connection uh, depending on, on the definition between 4 and 24 hours. And it also shows you, if I have to cancel a ticket, how much it's going to cost me. Do I even get any money back from the cheap ticket? Um, one interesting thing that is listed there is, uh, in some of the com uh, rules, it's called combinations. It says if uh, add-ons are permitted or if end-to-ends are permitted. Um, I just displayed on the, on the button, end-to-end -end is, uh, for instance, if you want to fly uh, Kuala Lumpur to Helsinki, and for whatever reason you don't, fly, you don't, you don't find a valid fare, you can fly um, Kuala Lumpur to Singapore and then Singapore to Helsinki on two different fares, on two different flights. And if end-to-end -end are permitted, you can combine these two fares on a single ticket and if you miss your connection in Singapore because you didn't buy two separate tickets, they have to accommodate you, put you up in a, in a, in a hotel room, or they have to put you on the next available flight, whereas if you book it at two separate tickets, you would be lost and you would be on your own. You missed your connection. So um, it's hardly used because usually you would always find fares that go from A to B, like the place, or A to C, the places you want to go. So you usually don't have to do this, whereas uh, add-ons are going to be really interesting uh, in a few minutes. Add-ons are just like you're flying, um, for instance, Kuala Lumpur to Helsinki and back to uh, Kuala Lumpur, and then you check on another flight from Kuala Lumpur to Singapore for whatever reason, just because, for instance, you just have to directly get to Singapore. That is, if add-ons are permitted, you can do this. If add-ons are not permitted, you cannot do this. This is going to be important in a few minutes, but the other fair rules are just, yeah, you can just read the plain text. You don't have to usually read the, uh, the rules on the, uh, on the uh, like expert flyer or orbits. Um, if, we, if we try to book a fare, you're going to see all the uh, information. Like on the top, we have a fare from uh, London to, to New York, or Newark in this case. Uh, it's 82 euros each direction, and then there's lots and lots of uh, surcharges and fees and whatever added, uh, like security fee, airport fees. Uh, you're, using, you're going through customs, going to cost you like, I think, yeah, $5.50, which in that case is uh, $3.91. Uh, $3 and there's also fuel surcharges. And also because you've, uh, you're starting in uh, Great Britain, 
there's also an airport passenger duty. It's like a tourism charge that they're going to charge you, which is actually quite a lot. On the upside, the other fares are a bit cheaper because, well, they still want to market cheap fares, but they had to pay 68 euros to the uh, UK government or whoever. So all those uh, single small components, even if it's just a couple of, of, of dollars here and there, make up that entire fare. And like in this case, if you add up the, uh, the two uh, fuel surcharges, which are listed as, as YQ, which is the internal identifier, it's 160 euros roughly in uh, fuel surcharge, and the ticket price itself was 160 euros. So like 50% of, 50 of the big ticket items is fuel surcharge. So later we're going to try to get rid of some of these uh, surcharges to save some money. How do the uh, reservation system uh, work? I mean, how do you make a reservation? Uh, essentially, first of all, an airline, when they like, send out the PDF that we've seen, they have the uh, fare basis with all the rules. They have the routing rules, which tell me where can I actually fly. And they have like a price sheet attached to that. You can have different routes on the same uh, fare rules. So it's all a combination. They load it up into the uh, reservation system and say, this is a fare basis. Uh, you can fly these routes, and it's going to cost you this much money. Um, I've shown this as, as direct provisioning. Usually there's intermediate systems because like, there's multiple reservation systems on the internet on, on, in the world. So Lufthansa only wants to load it once, and they want to distribute it across all systems. So there's intermediates that I just didn't show just to keep it a bit easier. Then on the uh, global distribution system, you have that fair database, like we've seen on, 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 on an expert flyer, how much it's going to cost me to get from A to B. Um, you also have the inventory, like we've seen before, because you have to know, do I have a seat available? And you also have what's called PNR on the uh, left side. That is, like, if I book a ticket, the uh, information that I have in an electronic ticket is it's stored in that system. So I, if I can just look it up and see what my reservation looks like. It's stored there. It's not stored with the airline. Uh, through the uh, functions that the uh, GDS exports, a booking engine, if they have a contract, can access that database, just like I do it with Expert Flyer, through a website. Uh, if you go on orbits, you would connect to this uh, thing like from the bottom and just make orbits look for, look for a fare, look for a flight, look for inventory, and eventually you're going you're gonna to buy a ticket and they're going to issue a PNR. You give, they give you the uh, like six letter code and it's going to be stored there until you fly. So where can we detect this? Where, where are error sources on this? Uh, obviously, the, uh, the most obvious one top right, somebody just made a typo on the price, it was supposed to be $1,000 ends up being $100. So you save $900 if you find it fast enough and you just book it. Um, fair basis could be that somebody made a mistake. It was supposed to be an economy fair. Somebody messed up the first character, ends up being first class for free or for the same price. Did happen. Um, could be wrong routing rules. It's supposed to be Frankfurt to Dubai, but nobody tells you that you have to fly Frankfurt to Dubai. You're just flying Frankfurt to New York to San Francisco to Hawaii to Tokyo to Dubai. Did happen as well. Uh, sometimes they don't have rules where they say which routes you have to fly. They just say, okay, whatever route you fly, you can fly up to 20,000 miles, and uh, we don't care how you get there as long as you comply with the other rules. Usually those, those, uh, the amount of miles you're allowed to fly would be uh, roughly 20% more than like, the direct flight, but they do make mistakes on those as well. Um, on the inventory si uh, side, there, there might be differences depending on which country you book. Uh, so it's actually worth checking different countries for different fares, for different inventory. Could be that the flight is apparently sold out in Germany, but it's still available in Asia. Um, on the booking web, uh, websites, um, there's typical problems you find on, on websites. They make errors, as everybody, and we can just try to exploit them. I mean, why should I care about all the things that's on top that's kind of hidden from me and kind of complicated if I can just find an error on a, on a travel website and not care about anything else? So the logical step to attack the entire thing is I have to connect from the bottom from the booking engine because that's the only thing that's exposed on the open internet. And I would just screen scrape the heck out of lots and lots of websites and look for the cheapest fare. So um, I started doing that. And the first thing that I found is like, remembers me like the mid 90s, a uh, website called Sky, Tour, uh, Sky Tours. They have websites in, every, in, in, in lots and lots of different countries. Uh, which is nice. You can just click between the different point of sales, you diff get different inventory, different prices, easy to do. I found this ticket, him back to New York, roughly 1000 bucks, way too expensive. Um, I want to do screen scraping, so I looked at the HTML source code. Oh, 
they've got all the fair bases, all the information on the client side, which is nice because on this, they only say essentially it's that flight, it's an economy. And on this, the second row says, oh, look, it's that booking class. And they, they already, on the bottom, they tell you what the exchange rate, exchange rate are on the currencies. They tell you everything. So in Firefox, you just use Firebug, you change a couple of those things, uh, change the flight, suddenly total flight is 15 bucks. Uh, it's like, I mean, it's, it's not, like, 1995, I don't know, it's, it's too old. I, I, I try to, I, yeah. I, I contacted them like three different times in different countries, try to make them aware, like, well, you're not aware of any problems. Like, yeah, I can show you the screenshots. Like, yeah, it's just a cheap flight. It's like, okay, should I book it? It's like, no, it's, do whatever you want. So a couple of weeks later, I just booked it. I got myself a nice business class fare to Singapore, just, yeah, changed the price a bit, uh, booked it, told him, like, this is what happened. And immediately afterwards, I got the PNR, so I had a reservation, I got seats reserved. I can, I can select food, like, book the cook. You can actually, I want the lobster on that flight. You can do everything. And they, they got, they got some, deducted some money from my credit card, and a week later, they, they emailed me and said, yeah, we're kind of missing 4,000 bucks from you. It's like, yeah, I told you. So they canceled the ticket, but, I mean, what do you expect? But I checked this. I made the screenshot like a week ago. And they haven't changed it since probably two years. Hmm. Uh, Sky Tours. Just look for Sky Tours. They have websites in every single country. <laughs> uh, I could click on buy. They charged my credit card. I got a PNR. So by the German law, exactly the, uh, the German point of sale, I have I kind of have a contract with them because they they got money from my credit card. But I wouldn't argue because I know I messed around with the website and. It's obviously not supposed to be that way. But just out of basic principle, I had to, I had to give it a try. I would, have, I would have called them anyway because I didn't even want to fly the flight. But, I mean, heck, Singapore Islands for 400 bucks in business class. You've got to try it. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, but eventually, I mean, the point is, I mean, you changed hmm. your own reservation date hmm. and you weren't able to buy the ticket for the price you changed it. I was, yeah, I, I was able to at least uh, try it and, and book it and I had it. I, I, I mean, if there was a legal lawsuit, I don't know what, what's going to happen, but I didn't, I didn't want to fight it. I, I, got, I, got the t I got the ticket at first, but after a week they figured it out. Well, if you book like the same flight, change the fare basis to something that's more flexible and actually cancelable up to like a couple hours before the flight. Anyway, I won't argue the, uh, the reason I actually looked at the site was just because I want to do screen scraping. So what I did is I did screen scraping. Well, why did I do it? I didn't want to sit on the, on, on the, on the laptop and type in all the airports on my own. So I didn't want to care what the, uh, the booking system looked like, uh, the, uh, the, the, the uh, background. I just want to go to all the different websites and say, okay, this weekend I have time. I want to go to a random place that's interesting, go find me some interesting fare, and uh, just search randomly on, on different websites. Um, there's a brilliant Perl module to, to get that done. Um, I set it up to search on, on huge sites like Expedia Orbits because I, I figured, okay, if, I, if I'm going to find something, uh, chances are that Expedia Orbits don't care if they lose a couple hundred bucks. Uh, they just let me fly where smaller airlines or smaller ticketing agents, they might really suffer because they're losing a couple of bucks. Um, I figured out, why, why should I search on my own? There's so many travel websites. Let's search on like 10 different websites for you. So I just started screen scraping those as well. Uh, up to the point where they actually showed uh, German train tickets in the system as well. And uh, they, they were showing up as like really cheap. and was like, ah, and I'm going to stop using them because I don't want to take trains. Um, like I said on SkyTools, they have different countries. Uh, you implement it once. You just have like one form that you could change the country. And you have 20 different ways of searching for fares on, a, on the same website, different inventory, different fares. Uh, brilliant. Uh, did that for a couple of, uh, couple of weeks, couple of months. I ended up implementing 10 sites. Uh, questions? Hmm? Uh, when you were running many searches, Some websites are limiting to like, like once every 10 seconds or something. So currently, the, uh, the one that I'm currently using, I'm, I'm doing a random sleep between three and, four, three and five seconds, which is uh, all, I, all you need. Um, but they have like, so, much, so much stuff running in the background. It's gonna, the queries are taking a couple of seconds anyway. 
So um, the Perl module really rocks. It's really easy to implement all that stuff. Um, but in the end, websites change so much, it's not worth it. And you really have to say, OK, I want to fly on that weekend from A to B. Find me the best fare. And I hardly found anything interesting. So um, screen scraping might be illegal in your country. So I just did it just to yeah, see how it works. Um, but now let's go get closer to the uh, real fare basis. Um, what would I look for? Like I said before, there might be typos. I can just look for typos in the system. Somebody punched in a $100 fare instead of $1,000. I can find a flight where I can fly more than I'm supposed to fly, or I can uh, do the so-called fuel dump, which is the most interesting one. If I can combine multiple fares, I might save some uh, surcharges. Um, how would I um, qualify a good fare if I'm automatically searching for fares? Uh, essentially, there's a KPI for that. I mean, if you just divide the, number or the, the price by the number of miles, you get like cents per mile. And if that number is really low, you're getting a lot for your money. If that price is really high, the flight is really expensive, it's not that interesting. If it goes below a certain threshold, my program would write a, a lot message, say, OK, I found something. And once a day, I would manually look at all the interesting fares it found, just to speed up this process a bit. Um, yeah, you're going to skip all that as well. So again, I use the, uh, the Perl module. Um, I'm actually using one single website to get access to all those base fares. Uh, I won't name it in the, uh, the slides because we're going to hand it out. If, if you want to know it, just ask me. I mean, oh, there's no recording Travelocity, so Travelocity Canada, uh, travelocity.ca. It's, uh, it's pretty nice for that. But um, yeah, you can also look in the source code. The, there's the URL for the uh, source code in the back. Um, you can also check there's a tool called KVS tool, which is essentially doing the same. Um, they are selling access. But you can get a demo for free for a couple of days. Uh, it's all web-based. Uh, you start Wireshark, and within a few minutes, you figure out where that they get the, all the data from. So you can use essentially the same sources, because that guy is also piggybacking on other open systems and selling access for something that should be free. Um, I also tried buying access. Like I had a guy that, a friend that actually started a travel agency with the sole purpose of getting access. Uh, it's it's kind of expensive. Airlines don't really trust you, and they look weird at you if you only do queries but never book anything. And uh, it just ended up, ends up being way too expensive to make sense. So that's why I'm using. Or I'm looking for open sources. There's a couple of open sources on the internet that we can use and everybody's using. So there's no reason to go through travel agency, but for the fun of it. Um, I also used to to calculate the uh, the cents per mile. I use a website called uh, Great Circle Mapper, which is uh, pretty nice if you want a map way of actually flying. Um, and I created a database. So it's an SQL light database. It uh, maps all the airports to areas. Like the world is, is split into areas. And essentially, I only want to search for flights that are across areas, which are like long haul flights, not just like short domestic hops. Uh, I need I needed to have the, uh, the distances just to calculate the uh, cents per mile. And I always wanted to know what's the best price on any given route that I can, uh, I can get. Um, also gives me a raw listing if I want to do a query afterwards. Um, you can get the uh, source code of that. And if you want to help, yeah, well, feel free to. Um, SQLite is, is uh, pretty common, so you get a nice uh, front end. And you can just use whatever SQL queries you're used to and just do whatever query you want uh, based on all the data that you have. So that's pretty nice. Um, one thing that I found uh, was uh, a fare from San Francisco to Abu Dhabi. Um, it forces the routing rules and force you to fly San Francisco to um, New York to Casablanca to Abu Dhabi and back. And the base fare is 160 bucks, 170 bucks, and it was supposed to be 1,700 probably. If you look at the other fares, like 1,650 bucks, 860. So it was supposed to be in the middle between because their booking code Q is uh, usually between K and M. So they're just missing a digit in the price. And nobody's flying that route. It was filed, um, the effective date, April this year. So uh, it's been filed a couple of months ago, and nobody dared or cared to fix that bug. So if you, fly, if you find seats on those flights, it's Delta Airlines in the US, um, Royal Air Morocco, Transatlantic, and then Etihad on the way to Abu Dhabi. You can fly for pretty cheap. Um, now for the, mo the uh, most interesting one. Um, essentially saving, saving money on, on most flights, it's the, uh, the fuel dump. What is the, uh, the fuel dump? I mean, in a nutshell, it's this. 
uh, Hamburg to London, London to Boston, and return, plus some random flight in uh, Argentina, total cost 224 euros. With like transatlantic flight for 224 euros, it's kind of cheap. Usually they were asking like 450 euros probably. If you look at the taxes, we're missing lots of lots of fuel just by adding that flight. Another example, uh, Hamburg to New York, uh, out on Saturday, back on Sunday, 170 euros, plus some American Airlines flight, uh, which is totally out of line if you look at the other flights. It doesn't make any sense. But if you, on the left side, look at taxes, total taxes, 52 euros. Should have been more like 350. So this is what, what the fuel dumping is about. It's essentially adding another flight and tricking a booking system into somehow forgetting the, uh, the fuel surcharge, which is a major part of the, uh, the total cost of a ticket, and you would still be able to fly. I mean, I've flown these tickets quite a lot this, inside the community. People are doing this every single day, and nobody cares. Um, what is, yeah, YQ, that's the, uh, the short for the uh, fuel surcharge. It used to be a, a fixed surcharge that is part of like the base ticket price you're paying. The reason they, might it, they, they made it like flexible and like as a, as a separate item on your ticket is because the fuel price was changing so much in the last years that they figured if they always had to recalculate all their fares they fired for like the entire year, for the entire season, uh, they would have to do so many updates, which is going to cost them also money to update all the fares in the uh, re uh, reservation system. So they just said, okay, we, we just make it a separate item and it's easier, it's cheaper for us. And yeah, now we can, we can use this uh, to save some money. Interesting to know, the fuel surcharge and all the other taxes are collected by the carrier that is issuing or plating your ticket. It's not collected by the carrier that actually wants your surcharge. That is interesting to know. So if the uh, plating carrier fails to collect that surcharge, you that carrier would never, never get it. They would, they would never care because they would usually even never get it because they have, they have an interline agreement. It's the same interline agreement that allows you to essentially check your luggage through uh, from Kuala Lumpur to Singapore to Singapore to Helsinki on different carriers. If it's different airlines, they ha these airlines have to have an interline agreement that allows you to check your luggage through. If they don't have it, you have to pick up your luggage in Singapore and recheck it. And that's the same with the uh, fuel. So essentially what we're doing now, the trick is to find airlines which kind of forget to collect that, that uh, item of the, uh, the ticket. And well, then we save money. Uh, the best way to do this, unfortunately, they changed it. If you go to London Heathrow, uh, Landside, they had like a ticket counter from American Airlines and British Airways. Um, you want to get on a British Airways flight, it was kind of expensive. You go next door to American Airlines, issue the same ticket, like same seat on the same plane, most likely the same price, doesn't have to be. But they were not asking for the fuel surcharge because they didn't have an agreement with British Airways to collect that fuel surcharge and give it to British Airways. So British Airways knew that they would never get it. American Airlines never wanted to get it, so you just didn't. Yeah, pay the fuel. You could you just get the British Airways ticket cheaper if you just bought it on American Airlines. Unfortunately, that changed a couple of years ago. But this is like the uh, the perfect way of uh, saving money. Um, how can we do this uh, nowadays? Like you've seen the uh, what's in the community called the uh, third strike. You just add an additional flight to the flights you want to fly, and you somehow trick the system into yeah booking the ticket on a forgetful carrier that doesn't issue or doesn't want to collect the uh, fuel. You can also do a so-called open jaw flight, usually across different countries, or a double open jaw, which usually works. Um, and in the community, if you go to websites, I've got a couple of references on here. If people are talking about it, we have a kind of lingo to kind of hide the information in the open because otherwise people would abuse it. So it's really like uh, C1 is like continent one, it's US, C2 is Europe, RT is round trip, and like the 13 miler is, uh, well, a 13 mile flight that you can use to dump the fuel. Like Cable Beach, well, if you go to Wikipedia, you find out, oh, Bahamas, Nassau, whatever. It's, it's easy to find out, and then you can find out, okay, I have to find a cheap flight out of that city, which I can use, uh, Windy City to Steelers, Windy City, Chicago, Steelers, I don't know where they're playing, but that city, probably Pittsburgh or something. Um, I don't care, it's, but it's, uh, if you look on the forums, sometimes they have like keywords and which relate to really specific flights. Uh, flyertalk.com, milepoint.com, yeah, you know flyertalk, yeah. I have the references in the back so I don't have to write everything down. Um, 
open draw. This is one example. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't really fit on the air. Uh, there's, there's another connecting flight. Uh, it, it starts in, in, in Brussels, Belgium, and uh, goes to the US, goes back to Germany instead of Belgium, and uh, somehow you can fly transatlantic for 180 euros instead of probably 500. So that's like simple, uh, simple open draw. Um, I, I won't show this uh, on this presentation. A uh, couple of days ago, we just did it and immediately saved 1,500 bucks for a ticket um, out of Canada. It does work. You just have to try and try to get across countries, like different countries. But it's not. It's out of the scope for this presentation. If you're interested and if you're living close to the national uh, cross-country border, just yeah, get in touch with me afterwards. We can uh, have a look at this. What we're going to talk about now is the uh, third strike, like the most important stuff. Um, what's the process? First of all, you need to find a flight that is suitable to be the third strike. Um, I use uh, metrics.itasoftware.com. It's a company that recently got bought by Google, but they still have a demo system up uh, on the website. Um, you just start looking for cheap, really, really short flights, usually on really, really small carriers. So the best sources to find those carriers, best sources to find these uh, flights would be uh, Hawaii, Caribbean, Pacific, Fiji, whatever. Just yeah, write that down. Just try to look for those flights on those islands, and you're going to find something. Um, you also need a good fare to actually get started because if the fare is really expensive and you're only saving a few bucks on the fuel, it doesn't make any sense. But if the fare is really cheap and the fuel is quite a lot, you're saving quite a lot of money. Additionally, both of these tickets have to allow these add-ons so they can actually combine the tickets and issue the ticket because if the airline doesn't allow you to combine its ticket with another airline, you won't be able to issue it as one ticket like the add-on that we had on, in the beginning. So the ticket rules specifically have to allow that add-on. Um, how do we find the uh, third strike flight? Like, how do, how do I find a cheap flight? I go to the uh, ITA software website. It's a travel website. You cannot book a ticket, but it gets you like full access to the uh, search features you have on, on kayak.com or bayama.com. It's the, uh, the company that built their system. So you just say, okay, I want to fly from Honolulu. And you say, okay, show me all the nearby airports in like a 300 mile region. Uh, list all the airports, you just select all. Destination, you just select an airport that's really close. Also, select all airports in the, uh, in the area. You get a list of cheap flights. 43 euros for a flight from, uh, whatever, intra Hawaii. Couple of options. Um, first, I forgot to set it to um, the point of sale US. I, I try to buy the ticket from, uh, from Germany. If I change it to US, I get a bit different flights, and the same flight actually gets a couple of bucks cheaper. It was working again. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> at least you get free drinks. I mean, that's better than some some carriers. Hmm. Yeah, let's hope the uh, predictor works again. Otherwise, you have to just turn the monitor. So what you do is you you start searching for all those really really short flights, usually like like 20, 30, 40 minutes, uh, and really suggest. Pacific Islands, guys. Go look for Pacific Islands, like the places you ever wanted to go to. They have the, those really, really small carriers. Do a search on that website because those small carriers, they are no, they're not used to dealing with bigger carriers. So their fare rules essentially say, well, we have a 19 seater plane. As long as we have seats available, we're going to sell you a seat for 50 bucks. They don't care about interline agreements, uh, processing luggage for other airlines. They don't care about cancellation of tickets and that kind of stuff. It's just like, as long as we have tickets, we're selling tickets. As long as we have seats, we're allowing people to get on the plane. Uh, those carriers are also pretty good at forgetting uh, yeah, um, the, uh, the fuel surcharge. So you just go on that, web, that website. Oh, thanks. Um, is the microphone working? Yeah. Oh, OK, perfect. Um, so you find a couple of, of suitable uh, of those short flights. And then you have to find base fares which are really, really worth tricking. I mean, I said really low base fare, high fuel surcharge, because in that case, we're going to save a lot of money. 
So um, you can use the, uh, the tool that I provide. You can go to the, uh, that website where I just put some of my output, uh, or you can just look on Flyer Talk and just, uh, just sign up for promotion fares from, from your favorite airlines. Whenever the promotion comes, chances are pretty good that the, uh, the base fares are really cheap. Um, how do we do this now? Uh, yeah, you, you find the flight you want. You, add the, uh, you just go to like Expedia, Orbitz. I kind of like Orbitz. Um, you enter the flight you want. You add the uh, third strike. And somehow the ticket gets cheaper. Uh, don't call the airlines if it doesn't work, because the airlines don't want this to work. I mean, you can, you can ask somebody, like, can you help me doing this? But don't call the airline, because the more people make them aware of what, what's happening, chances are pretty high that eventually they're going to they're gonna fix it. So um, like a nice example, yeah, don't need to like, use your laptop like it's not a lab session. But I found a flight a couple days ago on the uh, 6th of November between LA and Tokyo. Um, you see multiple airlines uh, essentially have the, the, uh, the same price, 133 bucks Canadian starting. And if I try to book it, like you see the, uh, the first character of the uh, fare basis is K, so it books into the K booking class, which actually gives you 100% miles on, on most airlines. Um, you try to book it on, on any random website, it shows up as like two flights bookable, um, LA to Tokyo, and then uh, Tokyo Haneda back to LA on ANA in booking class K, uh, total fare 70, 788 bucks, even though the base fare was like 160 or 140. So how do we get to that price? Um, the ITA website allows you to look that up. So it shows the, uh, the K fare that that flight is based on, shows it's like 60 bucks each direction for the base fare, couple of smaller items, and a $576 fuel surcharge. So we can get rid of at least some of that fuel surcharge. The ticket's going to be yeah, pretty cheap, pretty nice. So how much could we save? Um, if you compare the regular ticket to the uh, fuel dump ticket, on the fuel dump we have essentially the uh, same cost for the basic ticket, the same kind of small ticket item fees. Uh, we're going to hopefully save all the fuel surcharge, but additionally we have to buy that flight on Hawaii, on some Pacific island, in the Caribbean, somewhere. We have to buy that additional ticket. So that's going to add to our cost. But best case, we're probably going to get down to like 300 US dollars for that flight. Best case. Often you don't get the best case. But in theory, we could get it down to that thing. So what do you do? Um, I just added on the, on the bottom one, I have the uh, same flights I wanted to get on, on orbits. On the bottom thing, I just added another flight. Uh, it's uh, yeah, Northern Marina Islands, it's close to Guam in the uh, Western Pacific. You just add a flight that's like 60 bucks plus on Texas, and uh, total flight cost is now the, uh, the Texas, which previously were um, fuel surcharges alone, which counts as, as tax, 576 plus 80 bucks for other stuff, goes down to $300 total. Total ticket price, 483 instead of 788 before. So we try another flight. Just, like, there's more flights, like I said. Go on, go on uh, itasoftware.com, search for other flights that you can use. And suddenly the, uh, the total ticket price goes down to $400 instead of $788. You can just book this on, on Orbitz. It works. Um, how to improve the routing? I mean, who says we have to fly LA to, LA to Tokyo directly? Uh, what, is, what is actually allowed? Um, if you look at this. You can fly LA to Honolulu to somewhere in Japan. Oh, no, that's, that's uh, Hawaii again. Back to Honolulu to Guam to somewhere in Japan connecting to Tokyo. So you can make a nice detour through Hawaii and, and uh, Guam if you want to. So essentially, you then have just have to yeah, go on ITA or look what kinds of flights are available or just add a stop on orbits like the, uh, the multi-stop search you would normally do. And for 430 uh, bucks, you can actually uh, yeah, fly some more miles. You get more frequent flyer miles. You can stop in Hawaii. Uh, you can stop in, on Guam if you want. Or you can try to get one of the uh, new ANA uh, Boeing 787 test flights that they have going on right now in, uh, in Japan. You can try to get one, on one of those because the rules allow that. Yeah. Hmm? Sorry? Uh, the, uh, the test flights? Or? I, um, I know that they're I think they're flying between Osaka and Haneda. So um, the rules allow that. So, I mean, we can, we can try afterwards. I didn't see anything, any, any reason why it shouldn't work, because it's, it shows up as a regular flight. I'm sort of really crazy about it. Hmm? Um, have you ever had a situation where the check-in agent looks at your ticket and goes, WTF, right? Like, hmm. 
some some ticket agents are like um, I mean if if you I, one time I had to check in luggage while doing this and it's like uh, I have to manually label your luggage because our luggage checks don't allow you to put that many things on the luggage check. I mean, are you are you willing to pick up your luggage in, in Chicago and recheck it? It's like no, I'm not. I just try to get it as, as, as carry on. No, but um, some some agents are like if you're doing a mileage run and you're just going there and you can check in for other flights within the next 24 hours and the ticketing machine starts spitting out like 16, 17 tickets. Um, they look strange at you. I've, I've got a copy of a ticket that is like uh, 17 first class flights in uh, three days. And he's like, what the heck are you doing? So, uh, hmm, uh, you're going to get a microphone. So I know that if you uh, say you buy a round trip ticket and you don't take the first leg of that ticket because you're actually flying in from somewhere else, which is actually something I'm doing over this hmm. weekend, then without some sort of special dispensation from the airline, they will automatically cancel the second leg of your flight. And you've got to go yeah. field management and all that huh. sort of BS. With this, this third strike flight, I mean, I saw one of them, it was like you were going LAX to Tokyo, and then there was something in the Northern Mariana Islands. Physically, you're nowhere near that third flight. Is that, does that ever cause any kind of issue? I, I'm assuming you're not actually taking this add-on flight. Good question. The, uh, the third strike, in this case, it's, it's blacked out because I'm, I want you to, I mean, I left the last clue and I've already told the, uh, the state name. Um, you just add the third strike at last. And you can even have a couple of days in between the flights. So if you're, for instance, flying back to your home country and you add the third strike out of your home country to a different country, and there's a couple of days in between, it only makes sense that you actually get out of the airport, pick up your luggage, and then somehow forget to show up for the next flight. So if you just do it that way, it works. If you yeah, never add the, the third strike in front, unless you really want to fly it. I mean, if you're, if you're flying so many of these tickets, you can actually make a round trip of all, all those additional flights you're booking, and you can, you can use those as a sort of positioning flights just to get you somewhere you have to get, get to be in order to start one of those flights. But, yeah, I would just edit at the, at the end and just don't care. Don't care about the miles you're getting. Don't try to cancel the ticket and get some fees back or something. Just, yeah, forget about it. It's funny because now I, I've, done, I've done that on Lufthansa and didn't show up for some flights. And the uh, check-in machine, when I just put in my, my freaking flyer card, it shows like, do you want to check in for that flight in 2008? No. Do you want to check in for the flight in 2009? No. Do you want to check in? <laughs> you have to like manually go to the second page to actually be able to check in for that flight for that day. But, yeah, but they never fix it. And it's fun. So in a nutshell, we essentially saved 50% of the price. Uh, we managed to get uh, through San Francisco, Osaka, Honolulu. You can also go through uh, Guam if you want to. Um, you don't have to. It's, it's, this works on most flights, especially United States and uh, Europe. The, the, the reason why it's not working so good in Asia, and I had a hard time finding something out of Kuala Lumpur, is that the way that they are pricing the tickets out of, out of fear is usually they have a pretty high base fare. So the fuel surcharge is, is a bit lower, and the amount of savings you can get is substantially lower. So. To show this is uh, much better. Um, what's the problem? I mean, at some point the airlines might figure out what you're doing. Um, at some point they may figure out that you didn't pay some fees. Uh, and they might ask you to pay the fuel surcharge because that's what it, what it was like probably 20 years ago. It was normal that you show up at the airport and you had to pay some additional fees. But I've never seen that happen. I've never, all the reports, everything that I'm, other people I'm talking to, I've never seen that somebody was forced to pay like the fuel surcharge or was not allowed to fly. If it goes through like the regular way, it just works. Uh, just please do this with like big agencies and not with your small travel agency because if they end up in some mess and they are losing license, not as good. But I mean Expedia, nobody would try to cancel the license of Expedia. They wouldn't always be a travel agency. Otherwise, I mean, they, they, they have some lawyers to fight for you in that case probably. Um, yeah, as I said, best savings if the uh, fuel surcharge is high. So when you're looking for the fares, look for something where the, uh, the, the fuel surcharge is high. It might actually make sense to not just take the cheapest flight, but like the second cheapest because the savings might be higher there. Um, since we only have a couple of minutes left, I mean, this is not all you can do. There's way more. Um, this one's example, and it's, it's, it's a trick question. Um, the fare rules might, for instance, say you're flying, or this is for a fare between like Europe and the United States. 
and uh, you can fly, and if you're buying the ticket in Area 1, which is the United States, you're going to pay 150 bucks fuel surcharge. If you're flying, or if you're buying the ticket, not flying out of, or if you're, if you're buying the ticket in Europe, you're paying 100 euros. So the trick question is, and you're going to earn that uh, look from the first class rubby ducky, um, where would you buy the ticket? You, you have a winner. There you go. He Obviously. Said area three. Hmm. Uh, Japan. Just go to go to Japan, buy the ticket in Japan, and uh, KLM has a nice website. You just on, on the KLM website, you just change the country to Japan, and you're going to save fuel. You just save 100 euros, 150 bucks, depending on how you look at it. Um, what else can you do? As I said, there's some fares where you can just improve the routing and uh, just yeah, fly more for the same money, essentially. Um, if your question, just ask me. There's so much stuff you can do, so much stuff you can look up, so many ways to, like ITA, improve your routing. Um, unfortunately, we don't have time for that. Um, also not covered, um, point of sale tricks. Like I said, you can just go to Japan, you can do it to different countries. Uh, for a long time, it was really cheap to just buy tickets in Australia because the exchange rate worked kind of favorable. So you just, on a transatlantic flight, even without any tricks, you just save 20, 30, 50 bucks uh, sometimes. Uh, and then you have fare wars, which is, which is kind of nice. If you go back to this one, uh, you can see that uh, Continental United and also Lufthansa, they're like all on the same alliance. They are matching their fares. They're like filing the same fare. They, they don't compete with each other. They all have the same fare. But on this route, Delta Airlines try to get a piece of the cake and try to underbid or at least match the same fare that the other airlines had. So usually this has to happen quickly because you can only do an update every couple of hours in the system. And once they, they figure out that some other airline uh, sells something for cheap, they try to at least match with the price. But that's the moment when they end up doing mistakes. And that's what we are looking for. And uh, even this ticket, we, we checked it yesterday. Uh, Japan Airlines and American Airlines not even matched this price. They went down to $190 on the, uh, the base fare. So it even got, it even got cheaper. I mean, if, if now um, United or Continental matches at the same flight, you're going to save another 20 bucks on the, on the ticket. So this is always uh, interesting to look at. Um, yeah, currency fluctuations. Um, internally, the airlines or the, uh, the ATA uh, uses some, some artificial currency, which is exchanged in, in different ways. And it's not updated daily. So it might be that the uh, exchange rate on the open market changed whereas IATA is still using a different exchange rate. And uh, when, when Iceland uh, went belly up in the economic downturn, uh, you could just fly to Iceland. You have to be in Iceland and buy a ticket around the world for like 30, 40% off due to the exchange rate alone. Uh, yeah, like we've seen the uh, United Kingdom surcharge. If you don't fly out of the United Kingdom but instead start somewhere else, you just save 60 bucks, which might buy you a ticket to, for instance, Paris or Vienna. So if you're just going to start in Vienna, you're going to save that part. That's pretty nice. Uh, so conclusion. So I'm pretty much on time. I didn't believe it. Um, reasonable disclosure. I mean, what we're talking about, if it ends up on, on open websites, uh, too many people are booking it without really knowing what's happening, uh, some of the deals might get closed. Like if everybody is using that same flight in South America, uh, one thing that, that actually happened is everybody booked like the same flight in South America, and they must be really happy, like, oh, now we are selling like 200 tickets a day on those flights. We should get bigger planes. And half a year later, they have like the bigger plane, like waiting for customers. Why is nobody showing up? <laughs> so you don't make airlines happy, and uh, well, if, if too many people yeah, know everything and don't diversify a bit, it, uh, yeah, it does get close. It, airlines try to yeah, cancel the tickets, and they can be really quick canceling and, and closing deals. Uh, we had a deal on, on LAN.com, one of the tickets I've shown, that was essentially working for two years. And one day it showed up on an open website, uh, Fed Wallet, and within four hours it was closed. So the airlines knew what was going on, and it only took them like four hours to close it uh, once too many people booked it. Uh, don't abuse the information. Is there any particular reason? Sorry. Hang on. Has there been, ever been a reason why they've never sort of like enormously rationalized the, the system? Because, I mean, this is, this is obviously, the, I mean, all these logic flaws are obviously there because the system has just evolved and they've piled rules on top of rules on top of rules and it's all gone horribly wrong. Um, is there any reason why they have, they've, they've never, you know, like rationalized it? We, we talked to a couple of airlines, and the airlines are well aware. I mean, the, uh, the forums, the websites where we are talking, some mailing lists, uh, 
we know that there's some lurkers from airlines looking at this stuff, but they have so many problems. And one guy said, okay, we have so many problems, we have so much other stuff to care about. Um, did you ever think about why you cannot book a flight more than a year in advance? The system doesn't have a field for the year. They only have day and month. You cannot book it more than a year in advance. Which also means if you happen to have like a business class ticket or first class ticket, whatever, for the 1st of June this year, next year, 1st of June, you can also show up at the lounge and say, look, I've got a ticket, I want to get in. We, you give it a try. I mean, I, I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't do it with like Lufthansa first class or something where you get your personal assistant, they look up if your flight is okay, because what the heck, you don't, you, you don't have a ticket. They would, they would figure that out, but like the regular lounges, Probably you would you just get in. You just I, I foresee a business opportunity here. Yeah. You, know. uh, you can I mean, if you ever look at what tickets look like, I mean, it's an Aztec or QR barcode. Do you ever think about printing that barcode on your own and just putting it on a scanner in front of the lounge and just I mean, it's doable. Somebody told me I just. No. <laughs> so um, whatever you do, do not try to sell the information. There's a couple of websites that actually sold the information on the open internet, like through cashback affiliate links. Uh, people don't know what they are booking, they're just clicking on that link. Uh, they're t taking to Expedia where they can just book a ticket. Um, the guy who, who sold the information gets some cashback from, from Expedia or those sites, and all those dumb people that don't, that don't know what they're really doing, um, eventually gonna call the airline and, uh, well, kill the, uh, the deal for us all. Uh, how many award miles do you have in your account right now? Um, I'm usually I'm usually pretty good at burning. I mean, this year this year I redeemed uh, two long haul like Europe to Asia to the South Pacific award tickets. Uh, usually in business class because I don't I don't need first class and they don't have first class all the way anyway. But um, with my program I have to requalify every two years and I'm like quality, like one year I'm really earning quite a lot of miles and the second year I'm burning like probably 400,000 miles a year. So it's I'm, I'm really good at burning miles. I've, I've got some couple of friends who are like, they have a million miles in their account, but what does it give you? Because if you have a million miles and they increase the miles you need for an award check by 20%, essentially you just left 20% of a mile, or enough miles for the first class round trip to the US. So I just burn my miles like as, as fast as I can. So uh, one of the things, one of your strategies was looking for mistakes, so typos in the fare rules. Um, and you had your script that actually went and looked for those, and then you'd, you'd uh, go back and query your database afterwards. How s soon after that fare is posted do you need to book that, that ticket? How, how quickly does the airline figure out that they've made a mistake and then, and then correct it so that fare is no longer available? The, uh, the Abu Dhabi thing is pretty much on for half a year. Um, on, um, on other things, nobody wants to fly that route. That's probably, I mean, they, it's hard to find inventory on that route. But, um, other stuff, I've, I've been on a ticket, was uh, 150 bucks first class from uh, Minneapolis to Spokane with a couple of connections, and uh, that was gone within eight hours. So they could only update in that case after eight hours. So even if they figured out within 10 minutes, uh, it took them, uh, they had to wait eight hours for the update to happen. So some deals are really gone quickly, and this is actually one of the uh, next points. Um, they are changing the game. They are now, Amadeus is, is now introducing an upgrade where you can do online updates of, of fares and push the updates immediately instead of having to wait eight hours. So that's something that's changing now and it's, uh, yeah, I, I'm th actually thinking about yeah, getting, getting emails if something interesting happens instead of just looking at the website because I have to like pull that website, I don't wanna do that. I want emails. So uh, yeah, stuff is changing. So um, everything I talked about, like I said, the reservation system is also used for uh, cruises, hotels, rental cars. So every once in a while there's a typo on a cruise Somebody else found that. Um, you can get like one dollar per, per person and you get a room. Um, I, I'm just back from Beijing last weekend. There was a currency error. There was a uh, Chinese Kwai. It was supposed to be US dollars. I stayed at the uh, second best hotel in town for 27 euros a night. Um, next January, I'm, I'm gonna be on Bali uh, for 10 bucks a night uh, at the uh, Holiday Inn. They made a mistake. It was supposed to be 170 bucks a night. It ended up being uh, 10 bucks a night. And as you can see in the bottom right, that's why I made the uh, screenshot. The last guy booked it five seconds ago, and currently at that page, there are 223 people looking at that particular hotel. <laughs> so I talked, I talked to the, uh, the uh, check-in agent uh, in, at the uh, hotel in Beijing, and she was like, yeah, it was only available like three hours, but with more than 1,000 people booking that thing. <laughs> and we're dishonoring it because we want, the, we want the business. So that's the references I talked about, and well, I'm not sure how much time we have uh, for questions answered. We had some questions in the meantime. We don't we have time, but I'll just one last question. Hmm? 
Okay, you win. Mm -hmm. uh, so how do you upgrade from economy to first class again? Uh, so how, how do you upgrade from economy to first class? Yeah. Um, you haven't really talked about that. Sorry? Uh, how do you upgrade your ticket from uh, economy to first class? Um, I mean, I don't, I don't like the idea of just going to the counter at the, uh, the, the, uh, the gate and saying, I want to I yeah, give me an upgrade. But if you have some, some kind of legal reason to go there, like, uh, I mean, changing the seat is like the, uh, the worst one you can have, but I'd like to spend some money. Like at some airlines, you can actually pay cash to upgrade shortly before the, uh, the flight leaves, especially if the, uh, the flight is overbooked. You can, you can pay some cash, and instead of upgrading people for free, they would upgrade people that are paying, like, uh, for instance, uh, I, I heard from Amsterdam to, to here, it's like 300 euros. So it's, it's a reasonable price. You usually get the, uh, the miles as well, so that alone might, might be worth it. And then, well, if, if you start traveling a lot, if you're a frequent flyer, you get those nice cards, and they're going to upgrade you for free at some point. Otherwise, you get upgrade instruments, and, yeah, try to use them as, as much as you can. Or one, one thing you can do is, if you figure out by looking at the inventory that the flight is overbooked, you can just go to the gate and say, look, I've got some time. Uh, you can, yeah, bump me off that flight. You usually earn some money for that. You put me on the next flight. Um, even if they only say, okay, yeah, we'll take you as a standby, so they deboard you from the flight, put you on the side, and even if, they're not full, if they, they end up not being fully booked, um, they're going to put you back on the plane, but all the cheap seats are already gone, so they might just put you up in either business class directly or at least give you a more expensive booking class, like the fully flexible one. And instead of not getting any miles or 25% of the miles, you probably end up getting way more miles, so at least you get some miles. Or if they put you up on, a, on a, another flight, another airline, really expensive ticket, you might get an upgrade as well. But there's no quick way to just like this always works. But yeah, sometimes you just get lucky. I think that's all the time we have for questions. Henrik, thank you very much. I'm sure we all wish you our travel agent. <laughs>